I'm Bashak Leic, I am the writer and performer of The Millennial Immigrant. And I'm Mara van Ness and I'm the, we don't know what word to use, right? Co-writer, dramaturg of text and a director of The Millennial Immigrant. Welcome. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Uh, very nice that you are uh, here on the couch, on the Röhring couch. Mm. Um, first, I would like you to introduce yourself. Well, I'm Bashak Leic and uh, I was born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey. And I came here almost four years ago. And I'm the writer and actress of The Millennial Immigrant. Thanks. And mm. I'm Mara van Ness. And I was born and raised here in Amsterdam West, actually, and I'm the co-writer and director of The Millennial Immigrant. Hey, Bashak, what else? Can you s ex tell us a little bit more about what you are doing uh, in, the, in, the, in the performance realm? Uh, so first I did, uh, I was one of the performers in Who I Talent for Het Leif en Kreg. Huh. <laughs> I worked on that. And uh, then I, I start writing this project and we did the Fringe show. And now I'm working as a teaching assistant in the Gaste. Huh. And uh, so yeah, that's what I'm busy with at the moment. Okay. And Mara, do you? Uh... Uh, I just finished being the programmer of the Dreistein as a stand-in for, uh, for half a year. And um, yeah, I worked with the Gaste for a few years. And that's also where we met. Yeah. And uh, yeah, many different jobs, freelancing for different places, um, like Podium Mosaic sometimes for mm -hmm. building conversation. You're also participating or uh, in the Need for Legacy, no? Yes. Yeah, yeah I'm on the board okay. of the Need for Legacy. Yeah. yeah. Hey, and how did your collaboration come about? Well, um, <laughs> I was writing this and I just sent it to Fringe uh, my application and they said yes. And I met Mara in the Gaste back then, Boost, now Nomads. And I thought she was a very interesting person with uh, a lot of energy. And I'm like, I would like to work with her. So I sent her a few pages and then she didn't answer me for a few days. And I was like, she hated it. Like, <laughs> she doesn't want anything to do with it. But then she finally wrote me back and then uh, we just start working on it. And, uh, I yeah. don't remember me not responding. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I do remember. <laughs> I'm not a good mail reader, maybe. Yeah. No, I, I really liked it because at the time when she wrote it, it was because you were more um, uh, schooled for writing scripts exactly. for television, right? Yeah. So yeah. it was more a television script with a lot of characters that were speaking to each other, like scenes. Yeah. And um, but I really liked the tone of voice of it. And so we met up um, and we sat on my balcony, I think it was. Yeah. And we spoke for a long time about it and what it was about and what it meant. And um, I really felt a connection to it as if she was saying something that I wanted to say as well. And, um, and then we started to work on it, how to, get, how to make it into a theater language and how it could be performed by one person instead of all these characters talking to each other in exterior backdrops. How could it be a monologue? Yeah. So that was very challenging because she was like, this is great, but it's not theater. <laughs> you know that, right? And uh, yeah, because exactly that's what I was schooled for, you know, script writing. And I worked for this like Amazon show. So I, I'm, I'm very like all, always into like scripts and scenes and she's like, that's not how you write theater. So she had to teach me that. Also. But at the same time, I also said to her, like, why do you ask me? And I don't know if I'm the right person for you because I, I'm not a textual director. Like, I don't have much experience in that area. I, I, I was more taught in the, I think, the fashion also, <laughs> the, the time where theater school were, or the department that I was in was more about physical theater. Mm. Uh, so for me, language has always been a big part of my own interest, but I'd never worked with it professionally, so prof not so profound as, as she was writing it. 
And then I, I asked you, like, why do you ask me? And she was talking about, yeah, and I, I want to get all these immigrants involved and I, people with an immigrant background. And I said again, but, but why do you ask me? Because <laughs> as I said before, I lived in this area of Amsterdam my whole life. <laughs> I, I hardly moved, like a few kilometers maybe, but yeah. that's it. And, uh, and then you said something to me that really gave me an insight. Because you said, but I don't think that an immigrant mm. needs to be somebody who, who crossed country borders, but mm. you can also be an immigrant in a different way. And I feel that you are. And mm. I really had to think about that for a while. And it actually uh, fueled me to mm. do this project with you and also to have a different outlook on myself in why I've always been interested in these kinds of subjects. Mm -hmm. Because I, I do feel like an immigrant in some ways. Um, so that was also a, a connection that we had. And of course, we are both millennials. So. That helps. <laughs> but that was our pop references yeah. were <laughs> exactly. on point all the yeah. time. Yeah. So are you already sharing a little bit or explaining a little bit what you will be presenting? Maybe it's good to tell a little bit more about it, more that, that people can follow it as well. What are you presenting on Röring? Yeah, so we're presenting a, a <coughs> monologue. A, performed by Bashak of 60 minutes uh, that is called the millennial immigrant and yeah uh, it's a story about a friendship actually and uh, and um, it's about guilt carrying guilt and shame of past decisions and how to make peace with yourself and move on if it's possible to really move on and um, yeah but it has a lot of different aspects of course um, some politics um, but yeah, I would say it's about friendship, okay. basically. And why did you choose the title, The Millennial Immigrant? <laughs> we had a lot of discussion about it, actually. Yeah. Um, there was also the good immigrant for a bit, I thought. There were and like the, there was bad immigrants. <laughs> 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 good, bad and ugly immigrant. Yeah. No, I, th I think we talked about how, it's, um, how it were two boxes. Mm that we find a bit absurd also in a way, and that we, as I just said that we identified with it in a way, but at the same time we also don't identify with the, the stigma of it. Mm -hmm. That it's, so as you said, an immigrant, people think when they hear the, the word immigrant of a certain person who moved here, who has a, a, a different, who was raised in a different country, for example, or in a different culture, and that we think there are many ways to be an immigrant. There are also many ways to be part of a generation. So being an, a millennial, I always deny it. When people say, oh, you're such a millennial, I, I, it freaks me out a bit. Because I think like, why am I a millennial? Because I was born in the 90s. Yeah, <laughs> that... and because I love avocado toast. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah, exactly. Those two titles actually are the titles that given to you, not you choose, you know? You don't choose where you were born into and uh, which generation you were born into. Also, in this project, uh, our main character, M, uh, maybe I shouldn't spoil that much, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, you, uh, we try to dig deep um, how sometimes you make decisions based on what happened to your past. And uh, that really, uh, I'm, I've been really thinking about that free will in that sense. How, how, how can, can you really choose? Your decisions, or are there are they like uh, certain aspects of your life that push you into certain directions? So, yeah, I think that's why being a millennial and being an immigrant mm. and being this and being that sometimes do you really have many choices? And if you are giving this material, what to do with it? Yeah, yeah, we did a first version at Fringe, but we did a complete or most of it did Bashak did. We had a lot of conversations in between, and then she would write again. Uh, we did a complete rewrite almost yeah. of, the, of the dramatic arch, but also of the scenes. Yeah. And I really like the new beginning that you wrote, because we talked a lot about the concept of happiness mm. and how it's also, in what you say, uh, the idea of choice, mm. in that uh, Nikki says to M, um, are you happy? Mm. And then she starts, it's, it's, it's a stream of consciousness, really, this whole monologue. So she starts ranting on in her head, like, am I happy? Are you, can, I, yeah. Maybe I was a second ago, but now that you ask me and I start being conscious of it, I'm not, I don't feel happy anymore. Yeah. And how it turns when you, when you are outside of 
outside of feeling it. Yeah. And that this idea of happiness was really something that we um, that we both think about a lot. Yeah. Like, what is that? Because it's so it's such a thing that's so important right now. Like to be happy, how mm. to be happy, and uh, and is that something that you can make create for yourself to mm. be happy, or is it something? that happens to you or how do you, mm. how, how, how to be happy? Yeah, <laughs> basically. Um, Difficult question. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that also is a connection, I think, to uh, that it's not in the show, if you see it, but that is a really big mm. conversation or a really big inspiration for us while writing it and while uh, figuring out the, the voice of the play is, is that we talked a lot about Sisyphus mm. and the myth of Sisyphus where he has to roll a stone up the hill over and every time it's on top it rolls back and he's mm. punished by the gods mm. in this cycle of ever rolling a rock up a hill. Mm. And, um, and for us that really became kind of a metaphor that we could hold on to because in the essay of Camus he mm. ends the essay saying one must imagine Sisyphus happy. Again the happiness thing. Mm. And, and it comes back to us in strange places, like not normal. It, it's like <laughs> you were writing, and then you sent me. I'm writing all day, and I had this song on repeat. And look yes. what the title is: Sisyphus. Sisyphus. Like you did, it was not on purpose, and you got a tarot card, and it was like it was coming into our lives all the time. This yeah. myth. That man is obsessed with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's the thing about Sisyphus that he. Um, so it's not. It's, so it's a punishment that he has to roll this rock up and up and up, and it comes down again and again and again. But then, uh, for us, and also inspired by Camus, um, we talked about what can he decide for himself mm. to be happy with doing that? Like, is it about the motion or about the intention yeah. of what he's doing? Yeah, because if you think about it, if the stone really stands on top of the mountain, then what? It's also, it yeah. must be quite boring, no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The end. The end. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Happily ever after. <laughs> Scene yeah. two. Yeah. Hey, and I've experienced you uh, in the studio talking like this uh, quite some times. Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you work? How do you come to writing texts or creating material on stage? I feel like, yeah, we feed each other a lot with those kind of conversations. And um, then mostly I go and I write some stuff um, for days. <laughs> and then I bring to Mara and then we look over it and we try to see what fits and what not. But our conversations are very like fruitful in that sense. And uh, we mostly we go very philosophical with a few bottle of wine <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know it works <laughs> <laughs> quite a few bottles of wine yeah yeah and then if we go to to the rehearsal floor more mm. um, we tried out a lot of things also how to make it stream and but also how to very technical in a way yeah how to set it on kind of marks, markets in um, yeah. There's also in in I th for me as a director, it's, it's very important how to use the space mm. and what the dramaturgy of that space mm. is. Mm. So that also became uh, not so much a conversation, but more really trying it out right yeah. in different yeah ways. Because I'm I don't have so much experience on the stage. I like totally trust Mara in that sense. Um, but yeah, also as an actress, I'm not like a professional actress or whatever, but that's why we try to hold on to those emotions, those autobiographical realities in my life and in her life and try to bring that, uh, that sense of, of it to the stage. Yeah, and also your understanding of text from a mm. writer's perspective, how well you know the text and how well the text is you. Like yeah. it's, really an extension of who you are, I think. Yeah. Because it's very, the text is very, it's quite cynical and very funny at times and also on point. That's why I liked it. And, yeah. and that's actually for me, I, I'm not, I'm very, I think I can be a funny person in when I'm drinking a bottle of wine and <laughs> having fun. But in my work, because I, there are so many things to talk about in the world, I, I get very serious sometimes and I, I want to make a manifesto or it has yeah. to like, I want some things have to change and, and then you actually taught me that that humor 
Mm. That it really needs humor and it needs that air and it needs that s that cynicism yeah. uh, to m make it maybe even more um, approachable in yeah. that sense. Yeah. Yeah, and also sometimes even more heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How do you write together on a text? Because you're you're both. <coughs> Uh, writing the text, no, or at least busy. No, with it's it. mostly by shock. But yeah. what, so I say, co also for kind of by less of a lack of a better word, maybe you can help us <laughs> with it, because because I was really co coaching her kind of in mm. the tone of voice, and also for me not being a professional in that area at all. So <laughs> it was mm -hmm. for me also figuring figuring it out as we went along, and I just gave her a lot of uh, scripts and and theater pieces yeah. that I had read or that I had. had that had been given to me in school, uh, and also a lot of dramaturgies, and um, so so. I yeah, think she really coached me in theater writing, mostly like in in that style. Yeah, and how to make it into a monologue, and then yeah. sometimes what I do is that I think there needs to be a transition or the storyline. There mm -hmm. was no storyline yet when we began, right? So we were really yeah. working on this storyline with a lot of papers on the floor, like what happens because yeah. we had a character, but what does the character? What is the the, the change that the character goes through? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. And then sometimes I, I'm a very bad actor, but I, I act out a lot of things for you. I'm like, when did you? And then you are like, and then you write that with interesting words, kind of yeah. like, oh. yeah. <laughs> instead of me saying bullshit. But you get what I mean that there needs to be a transition somewhere. Or yeah. um, uh, so the performativity for, of the stage is also influencing the text again. Then yeah, I would say yeah. A lot. Because I can imagine that writing a text and performing a text are, are different qualities. Yeah, you struggle with that a lot, right? That's really yeah. hard what you're doing. Yeah, also like taking off that hat. And because I'm essentially a writer, I thought like psh, acting is the easy part. Writing is the difficult part. <laughs> so <laughs> before like we were going to do the fringe, at least like over like uh, a, a month left, I didn't even think about acting. And I'm like, because I memorized the text as you were writing, and I write with a lot of melody and rhymes, and ba -ba 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 -ba. there's all this, there's, there's like a, a song. She writes a lot of beat. Yeah, so it's I write beats. beats. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought I'm and just going to do it. You always you know? envision a drum. You always want a drummer on stage. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to do a drummer. When yeah, we, one day. When there's no corona. <laughs> she wants like. Yeah. 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 <laughs> also Birdman, um, but yeah. So that I really, I now this time I'm, I've been focusing on acting a lot because I learned acting is not only saying words. No, <laughs> that was such a revelation. <laughs> it really is because I thought the words are the most important thing. I mean, they are very important, but also how you deliver. And um, now I know. Yeah, and you are very interested, and I think that that gives you the um, that gives you a good ground to work on f f as a performer. You are very into the audience, mm. so she she is a performer who who's really interested I'm obsessed in her with audience. audience. Mm. Yeah, obsessed. Mm. <laughs> she yeah. just she wants to make that connection, and she really wants it to for her. So she writes words, and she's very perfect, much a perfectionist yeah. in how you want certain words and certain beats in it but then as a performer you have to reapproach what you wrote so it's really hard if you wrote it and you yeah. you perf perfectioned it mm -hmm. and then as an actor you have to break it open again because you need to see what works and, yeah. and what do you communicate yeah. yeah so then you have to be very self-critical to be able to write something and then perform it yourself and want to make a connection with an audience yeah and especially because it was a monologue so it's almost like a dance with an audience so you say something you do something and they do something mm. as well and i learned this dutch word in casira so you have to <laughs> in casira <laughs> that so now i know but how how do you work with the idea of the audience during your cre creation is that part already then? Because yeah, it's an a lot. Uh, part for your work, you say? Uh, yeah, for me, for me, a lot. Um, I always think about the audience um, when I'm writing. Um, it's not manipulation, mm -hmm. <laughs> I must say. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, okay, now I, I want them to laugh. Now I want them to maybe shed a tear, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that with those kind of intention, I'm, I'm trying to write. Especially, yeah, again, because it's a monologue, it's not a dialogue. So audience is my fellow actor on that stage. So I think you really have to be considerate. 
towards them, no? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also we struggled a lot with the first version we did with the beginning, how to start mm. a monologue, mm. which is always, I think, the hardest part. Uh, and, and the end. The start right. and the, and the end. Yeah. <laughs> but in between, we were fine. Yeah. We were okay with the beginning and the end was really difficult, and we changed it often. Even yeah. every, I think every time we did it, we changed it. Mm. Um, uh, and we started with you being late. That was an idea that we had, that she was late to, the, to her own show. Yeah. But it was so acted because she was not late. And, <laughs> and you came running in all the time with your bag. And, yeah. <laughs> and it just became a very strange thing where we were trying to... It was, it was not really felt, you know? It was not no. a real thing, but it was a trick that we had come up with. So the day before we <laughs> did the first run, we took it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it because, was such a relief. Yeah, it was really a relief. Yeah. So then it's because, and you kept saying to me, we we kind of argued about it also because you kept saying to me, it doesn't feel know. good, and you got very nervous about it, yeah. and then and then I thought, but how? I, I don't because it's almost like first love when you see someone, you mm. know if you're gonna like them or not, and like I couldn't lose the audience in the beginning. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a good call. That was a good call. How is the relation, or how do you deal with fiction and non-fiction in the, in the show? Or with fiction and the real, maybe that's... Oh, I love that so much. Um, uh, after we'd done uh, Fringe, uh, a few people asked us, our friends, like Mara's friends, like, oh, I'm very sad what happened to Bashak. Um, and she was like... <laughs> That didn't happen. A lot of people thought that was like an autobiographical story. Um, when you think about it on paper, the things that happened to my character, M, did, didn't happen to me. But I think, I really feel like everything is sort of autobiographical because it comes out of you. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have to happen on, like that, but um, it comes from somewhere. Um, and um, mm. yeah, so there's a very blurry line which I think it's also very suitable to the age that we live in, which mm. you don't know what is true yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what is yeah. not anymore in this post-truth world. Um, and people are obsessed with it being true. Uh, yeah. People really want it to be true because oh, we talked about this a lot. Yeah. Uh, also because of you, Inge, <laughs> <laughs> you helping us in that sense. But, but also that the jurors of Fringe said something about it and that, that it's kind of assumed that... Um, yeah, as I an think immigrant, it's kind of assumed yeah. right now, as a as, as you being Turkish, being on a stage here in the Netherlands, that that you have to tell your autobiographical story, because, and I think it's connected to identity politics in that you, yeah, know, mm. that, yeah. and also that people apparently feel more empathy for something that is real mm. instead of something that comes from a real place, but that you really wanted it to make universal. Like we're still discussing, should we even say the word Turkey at all in this whole story? Or could it be mm -hmm. any country where she comes from and any, dem like it, should we call it the Gezi protest or, or should mm -hmm. it be any protest that is happening in the world right now? Because yeah. it's such a universal story. And I think what is interesting about what you were looking for as a writer is that it's um, from a very personal thing that you feel, how can I communicate that yeah. by making it universal and, and making it into fiction? Because sometimes fiction, you can also distance yourself from it and, and be way, way, way more critical about the things that happen. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that we were actually kind of uh, maybe very naive, but we were very... Um, confronted with the fact that so many people assumed that I it was, was autobiographical and, 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 and also yeah. the fact that what, what you said, like what is an autobiography? Mm. Like yes, it's true, but her father didn't die. Yeah. No, like no. It, it's not true to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's also really confronting sometimes. I said to you recently that, it's, that there's these two women in, like there's a side character um, who's confronting M a lot. Yeah. And then I said, this kind of has also become our friendship in a way, you know? So it's also kind of autobiographical on our relationship yeah. in many ways. Yeah, many ways. Which I, I, I would hate to identify with Nikki. And if we would really have said that it was me, we probably would have mellowed her down. Like we yeah. would have, yeah. I would have yeah. been ashamed yeah. of yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the whiteness and the privilege that she has. Mm -hmm. But it's 
I think it's very good that we didn't and that she's not exactly me, but, but there's reference to. <laughs> yeah, and I must, I must say, um, I think when, when you write something, it's, it, um, when you're trying to write about something traumatic, whether it's shame, guilt, or something politically happened to you and then you were kind of victimized or whatever, I think it's, it's sometimes easier to write in a fictionalized sense. That doesn't mean it's a lie. That doesn't mean, it doesn't make it any less true. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like, um, yeah, it's almost like as a kid, you're, you're playing with something and, yeah. Um, Yeah, so that's that's the way that I chose um, to talk about that, and uh, yeah, that's that's how we realize actually Nikki kind of was based on Mara, but you don't do it consciously. Then when you look at what you have, you're like, oh, now I see. <laughs> so I'm I'm not I'm, I didn't sit on my desk and I said now I'm gonna write about my shame. No, you just just start <laughs> writing. You're like, oh, that's wow, okay, and then you just let it flow, and then you end up with something quite personal. Yeah. yeah, and there it also becomes layered again because then Nikki, Nikki does confront her with privilege or with yeah. a certain norm, the Western European norm of, of making art, which yeah. I think I do also to you. Yeah. <laughs> it's more complicated than that because yeah. she's also truly a friend and she's also truly, you see, so that, so it's not, the, I think you did that really well that these characters are not so flat. I think more, some are still still flat, like we, mm. we keep, as you keep working on them, they, they get more depth and, mm -hmm. yeah. but that, that it's not like that. Yeah. Like these characters are all complicated. M is super complicated. Like she, it, she, um, I'm kind of, I love her. I love her too. <laughs> and I hate her too. <laughs> yeah. She, she's so cynical and she, but she's so, and she's such an optimist at the same time, like it's, and it collides within her. Yeah. How to how to be happy with being all these things? Yeah. And and I think that is if we get that if we get that to the stage, I think we we've done well. We've done well. I'm really looking forward to meet M. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We have a few uh, questions, last questions. Could you say something about what you learned from each other oh. in this process in this past year? Maybe. <laughs> Is it <laughs> um, a lot? Yeah. I think I already kind of said it that yeah. that you infused me with uh, using cynicism or or jokes or mm. comic relief to talk about things that are actually not that funny. Yeah, and you taught me not only the, the theater, um, but also you taught me, okay, that's gonna sound very cheesy, <laughs> but you taught me my voice is valuable. <laughs> and you really taught me to speak it out loud, you know? And uh, yeah. 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 Because you're it very is. like, you know, you're very strong and um, powerful. And I, I, I took a lot of power in that and you gave me a lot of courage to speak my truth, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, you were really busy with that, right? With trying to... It's claiming your space. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Claim your space. <laughs> what are your plans for the future? Well, it's hard. Yeah. The future is hard right now. True, true. <laughs> but we have a lot of plans. Like, I, yeah. I think that we found something here where we've been talking a lot about all these new ideas we have and things we want to do. And yeah, this is not the last thing that we're doing. No, no. Sure. <laughs> this is just the and, beginning. And also we both long for kind of a, like a community. Mm -hmm. So we're also talking to other people, like how could we get more people involved in this, now yeah. in this collaboration that we're, we have going, how, how could it be stretched out or, or yeah. shared with more people? Yeah. Um, but what I like is that we always said we want to do it on our own terms. Yeah. So we want to figure out how we want to direct something. We want to figure out how to perform it. We want to figure out how to work. And, and we were also talking about, you know, we, we tr how to get subsidized right now, that it's really hard for everyone in the yeah. field, but also especially 
as a young maker, at a certain point you you go to all the places that are there for young makers or new makers. Yeah. And you, you've done at a certain point you've done the rounds. Yeah. Like, yeah. You've done all the festivals and then what? Yeah. Because the subsidized system right now is that if you don't have dates to perform, there's no money. But if you don't have money, you cannot make anything or get anywhere to get dates to perform. So it's kind of a chicken or the egg yeah. question yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is very tiring to us. Um, so it also made us think about, do we want to be subsidized at all, you know? Or are we going to say, screw you, we're going to... Hmm. We have to think more commercial or we have to figure out new ways yeah. to do that. That's a very practical answer to your question. <laughs> but I no, think, but yeah. yeah. Very uh, important also, no? very yeah. existential in a certain way. Yeah. 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 yeah, and you feel like there, there's not much uh, love for arts and culture going around these days. Um, but, but it's very much a machine that has to, hmm. it has yeah. to produce. And, and we really want to search, because we don't know. Nope. Yeah, no, but that's all. I, I like how you did the process, you know, that you first did, mm. showed it on Fringe and then took those experience to make, to remake it in a certain yeah. way. And that's almost not possible in this, this machine you're, you're calling, you're, you're mentioning. So uh, I'm happy that you uh, will show the second version of uh, The Millennial Immigrant. Who knows, maybe there will be a, th a third or the fourth. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Inga. Thanks. You want to You do it. <laughs> you do it. <laughs> okay. Oh wow! <laughs> this feels like this feel, kind of feels like our wedding. <laughs> <laughs> With the hair. <laughs>